So I am a composer and a musician. And when people ask me what instrument I play, I say that I play computer. And usually they think I'm being facetious, and they go talk to someone else then. <laughs> um, but that's OK, because we've accepted computers as a tool for the distribution and the production of music. But they haven't fully entered the public consciousness as a performance instrument or a ensemble instrument. So if this person is still talking to me, uh, they'll ask me about my projects, and I'll try to describe some, and they'll nod politely. And then I mentioned one project of mine that I co-lead a laptop orchestra. And there's always this very visceral response, this wondrous confusion. And that makes sense, because those two words have a lot of cultural baggage associated with them. Uh, people get there's a little bit of a dissonance there. After all, laptops are relatively new. They're flexible. Uh, they're constantly developing. And an orchestra is this fixed, monolithic thing, this peak of Western civilization. And it's, it's been around for a long time. It's got a vast repertoire. It's got a fixed model. It's accumulated what's called a, a common practice. So to define a laptop orchestra uh, is, is hard because of that flexibility. I'll start with what we're not. Uh, we don't play orchestral repertoire. We don't try to mimic orchestral sounds. We're not going to play Beethoven. In fact, we almost never use traditional musical notation. And a traditional orchestra, the roles and the form are the same for every piece. But the roles and the form for a laptop orchestra piece are totally different. And because of that flexibility, it's, we, don't, we don't really have a common practice because of that flexibility. Every piece, uh, there, there's no fixed model. Every piece is its own universe that's been created from scratch, specifically for us. Uh, and so to kind of explain what we do, we need to reconsider some of these low-level musical relationships. And so that's, that's what I'd like to talk about today. So the first is the relationship between a performer and an instrument. Traditional instruments are hard to play. There's a lot of variables and parameters to be controlling all at the same time, and that's why it's so hard to master. In the Princeton Laptop Orchestra, or PLORC as it's known for short, uh, on the other hand, we may have students only for one semester. Uh, they may have no previous musical experience. And so we don't really have time to turn them into virtuosos. And besides, the instruments that they're going to be playing may be different for each piece anyway. Uh, so most instruments are fairly easy to play. It's up to the composer to create them in software, define what they do, uh, and how we control them. So we need to get real-time performance information into the computer. Uh, we can use the computer keyboard and the trackpad. Not the most interesting uh, things to watch in a live performance. But we have a few more animated options. Here, someone is using the tilt sensor of a laptop, so merely the way that you hold it can affect the sound. Here is a string controller, which is a hacked game controller from a golf video game. So it tells the computer where your hands are in 3D space. Almost any electronic device can be appropriated as a, as a music controller. So this is fun to watch. And more importantly, it shows that there's a real performance happening. It's not just someone sitting down and hitting play uh, in iTunes. And so we have this data. And now we need to turn it into sound. Now any gesture, any input data can control any parameter of sound. That's a lot of things. With so many potential things to control, often some are being controlled by the human, and some are being controlled by the computer. And you can see what a big task this is. I mean, a composer has to define a music generating system and define where in that system we have control. This gets even more fun when we add acoustic instruments into the mix. We can generate synthetic sounds, but we can also manipulate real world sounds as they're happening. So we get to play with that relationship between real and synthetic. It also means we get to have virtuosos performing on stage, which is a lot of fun, of course. And it really highlights uh, this divide between the different practices that are going on. In this example, we have a violin player. Her sound is being manipulated in real time in the performance by an ensemble of Nintendo Wii controllers. Now, in my experience, not all instrumentalists are comfortable with this, uh, kind of being mangled by a computer. Those who have come from a different tradition or a different common practice can actually find it alienating. Uh, but those who choose to work with us are usually, are usually OK with it. The second relationship is between a composer and a performer how to transmit musical instructions. Again, Plork has no common practice. So you know, we need to have a way to have a composer tell us how to play the piece. 
Here's the most traditional system. We've got discrete events on a fixed notation for fixed ensemble. Now, throughout the 20th century, a lot of composers, they tried to inject a little more subjectivity into this process with graphic notation. This allowed a little extra room for improvisation and interpretation and chaos and the personality of the player to come through. And this kind of self-definition for each piece really makes a lot of sense uh, for a laptop orchestra. So here's a peek at what a plork composer actually writes uh, to define the whole piece. And here's just three examples of what a player might see. This one is instructions flying at you in 3D space, kind of like Guitar Hero. This one is how parameters change over time. This one is an animation that shows you what the tilt and mouse position should be. Now these are just three examples, and they're fairly well-defined examples, but a lot of plurk pieces have much less information than this. Many are just simple text directions that give the players a lot of freedom in, in how they play. So the task of musical direction extends beyond communicating to an individual to defining an ensemble an ensemble's behavior as a whole. And this is the most radical break from a traditional orchestra. The invention for each piece of a new ensemble dynamic. This is a, a realm of pure creation. It's outside of the technology and that the technology has just created a blank canvas for us to structure ensemble interaction on. Again, here's the traditional model. All of the performance information is centralized. The performance data has been created beforehand by the composer. The conductor is the sole source of real-time direction. All the players are united underneath the conductor. And if you step outside of this unity with a wrong note or a missed entrance or something like that, that's bad. You get in trouble. It's, it's authoritarian. Now, many plork pieces do have a hierarchy and do have a conductor. All the computers are on a network. So the conductor can be broadcasting any type of control information. But this conductor role is very broad. They could be controlling it very tightly over the network. Or in some cases, they may not be using a computer at all. Here, there's just a visual cue to say, move on to the next section of the piece. And even if a piece is centralized, information can flow back from the players to the conductor. That way, a piece can take all of this real-time information and actually have that affect how the piece progresses. A piece can also be decentralized. Everybody is functioning independently with the possibility for shared control and, and shared information. So maybe you can, th you can see a theme where the organization of a piece could be interpreted as a social or a political organization. It depends how deeply you'd like to interpret it, of course. Uh, some examples. Is everybody making the same sound? Or is everybody making different sounds? Does a player have exclusive control of his or her sound? Or can that sound be altered or stolen by other players? Does a piece give players a chance to shine as individuals? Or are they always part of a group? Are you technologically limited by a set of possibilities? Or are you able to rebel and create your own content and your own behaviors? I mean, these are big questions, right? I mean, we're getting beyond purely musical concerns. And the benefit to all these high-level conceptual questions is that they make a player deal with being a mature musician immediately, immediately upon, upon joining the ensemble. They have to learn how to function within an ensemble. They have to interpret the intention of the composer. The, the, the same types of self-analysis that we demand of the composer applies to the players as well. They need to be aware of the context of what they're doing and the limitations of what they're doing. They, they have to be self-conscious in a way that isn't demanded of conventional musicians. And so this word sums it up pretty well. This is demanding. It demands that players have responsibility beyond merely playing back notes on a page. It demands that composers are reanalyzing every part of their method. It demands pieces that are not just for showing off technology, but are actually an original form enabled by that technology. I've talked about the relationships within the ensemble. What we're still learning is how do these demands spill outside of the ensemble to its relationship with the outside world. 
it demands an education system that is okay with uh, an open curriculum. And it demands audiences that are okay with not having a pre-existing context for a piece of concert music. Every piece on a concert could be totally unfamiliar in form and content from, from every other piece. Now that's a big demand. That's the definition of a difficult art form. Uh, I'm not too worried about it though. I'm not worried because the response has been incredible from audiences and especially from participants. And it's showed that this kind of open artistic model is not going to, is not going to go away uh, in its scope and in its relevance. It's only going to continue to grow. Thank you.